The Jerry Pal Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Pal fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypal.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we got a great group with us today. Who do we have with us? Oh, we have an all-star lineup today, Eric. Um, Today, we're delighted to welcome Kathy Foley, who is a member emeritus of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and past director of the International Palliative Care Initiative, uh, project of the Open Society Foundation. And uh, Eric Krakauer says that's too modest. Eric, how did you refer to Kathy before we got started? Well, either the the founder or godmother of palliative care in the United States, and for that matter, um, the world. Welcome to Jerry Pal, Kathy. Thanks. <laughs> We're delighted to welcome Stephen Connor, who is a licensed clinical psychologist who has been been working in palliative care and for forty six years in various executive and leadership positions. Uh, Most notably, he's executive director of the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance, and he has spent the last seven years with the International Palliative Care Initiative. Um, Welcome to the Jerry uh, Jerry Powell podcast. I almost forgot the name of our podcast, Eric. (laughs) Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Eric. Uh, And then we're going to welcome Eric Krakauer. Alex. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we look the same. <laughs> We're going to welcome Eric Krakauer, who is a former mentor of mine uh, and is a um, protege of Kathy Foley's and a colleague of Stephen Connors. He's associate professor of medicine and global health at the Harvard Medical School and a senior attending at Massachusetts General Hospital and is a former medical officer for palliative care at the World Health Organization in Switzerland and was formerly funded by the Project on Death in America and the International Palliative Care Initiative. Welcome to Jerry Pal, Eric. Great to be here. It's great to have you all here. We're going to be talking about international palliative care. Big subject, lots to talk about. But before we get into that, who has a song request for Alex? What the world needs now. Ah, I will not even ask why you chose that song because it seems like it's the title. Is that right? <laughs> Is that a Jimi Hendrix tune? <laughs> Burt Backrack, <laughs> right. And covered by so many people. Dion Warwick. I will not be sounding like Dion Warwick, just for the record, but here's, <laughs> here's a little bit. We'll see. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Well done. That's awesome. Thank you, Alex. I'm really hoping that, you know, we got a lot to cover today. I think, you know, starting off, you know, we have an international audience. Most of our audience is from the US. Often, you know, the last two years, we're just trying to stay afloat in our own institution and survive these COVID surges. But, Kathy, I want to turn to you. Why, why should we care? Why is this important um, when we think about international palliative care? Um, thanks, Eric, and thanks for having this session. Um, I think, I think in a way, it's it's complicated by saying, you know, why should we care? Uh, because I think all of us would care that uh, that palliative care was available to all. And so, to then when we begin to think of um, low and middle income countries where they have such little access to healthcare provisions, um, and in where palliative care could make such an enormous difference. And so my own career began in like in the 1980s when working with the World Health Organization, who had a major effort to improve the care of patients with cancer. And yet um, 90% of the people who were in uh, with cancer were living in developing countries, and they had no access to cancer treatment, never mind to access to any other approaches. And so the, at that point in time with the WHO and the cancer unit, 
um, a group of people led by a man by the name of Jan Sturzvart, who was head of the cancer unit, argued strongly that palliative care should be part of a, a public health agenda and should be part of an essential program in cancer. Um, and clearly, these were patients who had such advanced disease that access to pain relief would be so important. And so why, why, why any of us should care um, is uh, so directly related to the fact that these are sort of easy wins and changes that we could make that would make enormous difference for millions of people. Um, and again, many of, I think, our, mem our uh, audience, I'm sure, in their own ways have been involved in, in working either internationally or working with international colleagues or being helpful to them in some way or another. So there's a, I think there's an extraordinary interest now in um, improving and taking the knowledge that we have. Yeah. And the next best part of this is that um, when we started this work, we didn't have an evidence base, but now we have an evidence base to make this both, to put it on a public health agenda and to put it on a human rights agenda. Mm. Well, I'm wondering, uh, I'm going to turn to Stephen. Uh, you know, as for our listeners, as, as including myself, as I think about all the things that I should be doing, <laughs> um, uh, it's sometimes helpful to hear kind of what motivated people to to do this type of work. When you think about your, your early career in this, what motivated you to, to really start working in an international perspective, improving palliative care? Yeah, well, we have it pretty good, actually, in spite of COVID uh, in high-income countries, and particularly the U.S., when it comes to palliative care, relatively speaking. You know, we're all <clears throat> got a long way to go to meet the, the need overall. Uh, but I was working at the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization uh, in, in late 90s through for 11 years up into 2009. But um, I was invited by uh, Daniela Mushau from uh, Romania to come to be a partner to them on a USAID grant to develop standards for palliative care for the country of Romania. And uh, in the course of a year when we worked together in a partnership to do that, um, you know, I got I, I, I spent a you know a good amount of time in Romania just with them, um, and we and, and I just realized you know it reminded me actually of the very early days in the seventies of of hospice movement and the energy that people had and the passion that people had about palliative care, mm -hmm. and I you know you could say then I, I got bitten by the international palliative care bug. And in the course of the years, you know, working in at NHPCO, we had a big project in Africa for, for a number of years that we, we led uh, and worked to build, help build up Africa and others. And I just saw more and more, you know, how, uh, how, how valuable and how important it was. And we, we really have a kind of 80-20 problem. Almost 80% of the need for palliative care is in low and middle income countries. And almost 80% of the palliative care that is being done is in high income countries. Mm -hmm. And we really, we really need to kind of switch that around to, I mean, that's really what we're trying to do. Kathy, you know, tried to do in the International Palliative Care Initiative is, is to, is to reach those people where, where the need is most and where the care is least. And um, before we talk about needs and what they are worldwide, Eric, how would you answer that question? Kind of, how did you get interested in, what motivated you to get interested to do this type of work? It was all a big accident, actually, um, unintended, or I didn't choose it. It chose me. I think I was thinking about this as, as Stephen was talking. I went to grad school in philosophy before I went to med school, and I was particularly interested in two late 20th century philosophers, Adorno and Heidegger. And what I took from them, a lot of what I took from them was that... <sighs> You know, what matters is not the political right or the political left and, you know, even right and wrong. That's always somebody's opinion. But the way I judge things, the measure of, of things in general is what causes more suffering than relieves it and what relieves more suffering than causes it. What will prevent or relieve suffering and what will generate it. And uh, so it's all about it's all about trying to prevent and relieve suffering. That's what medicine is. That's what called me to medicine. And when I got into medicine and saw that, um, well, I, I could have done anything. I liked everything. I liked psychiatry. I liked surgery. I liked, uh, I liked pediatrics. I liked everything. Um, but 
a lot of it was focused on one organ system or one category of disease like cancer or infectious disease or one technical skill like cancer or, or radiology or pathology. And it wasn't dealing with the whole person uh, in their cultural context. So that's what got me into palliative care. And then I came to realize, partly, I guess, because I grew up during the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. watching it on TV uh, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the the conflict in Nigeria, uh, the war with uh, Biafra and all the wars around the world, the the, the genocides in in um, in Cambodia and then in in uh, in Rwanda, there's an enormous amount of suffering out there. And I, you know, my understanding of of medicine and of what I'm supposed to do is not just cure, try to cure diseases, uh, but what's that's all part of trying to prevent and relieve suffering. And most of the suffering, as Stephen said, is out in the world, low and middle income countries. Mm-hmm. So. That's where I went. And when Kathy, um, Kathy and, and Susan Block directed this extremely important program called the Project and Death in America, which was one of the great uh, uh, catalysts of palliative care in, in the United States. Um, and as I was working on my project, which was on palliative care policies at Massachusetts General Hospital, I was getting more and more involved in in uh, or, or, or called more and more strongly, I should say, by the voices of suffering, usually unheard, emanating from the developing world. And Kathy, very generously, even though it was called the Project on Death in America, said, go for it, Eric. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been going for it now for 20, 20 some years, I guess. And when we think about you know this this eighty twenty and flipping this eighty twenty, what do we know about the palliative care needs worldwide? Sounds like there's a lot of suffering. Do we know more about that? Well, we were fortunate to get. Uh, I mean, uh, the for the formation of the Lancet Commission uh, that Eric was actually very very much uh, involved in in terms of of doing estimates of the need for palliative care. We use those in the global atlas of palliative care. Now we had come up with our original estimates, which were based because the WHO is rather conservative about not being wanting to be criticized for overestimation. They don't mind being criticized for underestimation, I guess. But anyway, they uh, uh, we we ended up at about 40 million people needing palliative care. But that we knew that was a conservative estimate and uh, probably an underestimate. So <clears throat> the Atlantic Commission came up with, with a number based on serious health-related suffering that Eric's talking about. Uh, and the number of people suffering with serious illness uh, well before the, you know, the sort of period that, we, you know, that the, we think of as six months or less now is not what palliative care is about. We want to get involved early from the, nearly from the point of diagnosis. And that number was 62 million. Um, mm. It's kind of float, floating back and forth. It's in that neighborhood, uh, the need um uh, and that that's the patient that doesn't include the families mm-hmm. so you know if you add on several family members uh because there are our patients also uh you get up to well over 200 million people a year needing palliative care each year uh, and it's going to grow uh Catherine Sleeman wrote a paper about this recently that projected out to 2060 and an 83 percent increase in the need wow. it's like it's like taxes and <laughs> <laughs> Eric, I, I think I, I, I feel like it's important to jump in uh, here, uh, partly because I, I like to talk. Um, but um, <laughs> I think it's really important to say uh, very clearly that when we t- with the three of us, and I, I think I can speak for my uh, my two colleagues here, palliative care is not uh, a response to uh, serious illness uh, in the developing world that could be uh, prevented uh, or treated. Um, it should go along with uh, the, 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 the strong efforts, the necessary efforts to make palliative care universally accessible, including to the rural poor, need to go along with equally strong efforts to make prevention of preventable diseases mm-hmm. and treatment of treatable illnesses accessible. 
So mm -hmm. yes, uh, women with cervical cancer uh, suffer horribly in the developing world uh, everywhere, but especially in the developing world. But there needs to be HPV vaccination so they don't get cervical cancer and there needs to be early diagnosis. Um, uh, I know our audience is mainly focused on geriatrics. So are we going to get to geriatrics one of these days or, uh, or, or, or shall we talk more about general palliative care? Because I got a lot to say about that, too. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on geriatrics, Eric? Worldwide. Well, again, how, how many hours do we have here? Um, <laughs> Succinctly. Uh, I do well, remember I that you like to talk. Yeah. <laughs> we, we want people to we don't want people to die prematurely obviously I mean, I every that's... word is yeah. carefully chosen like every <laughs> note in mozart okay right but i, I want to interrupt for a minute because Please. i think um i think there's a, a bigger picture here yeah. so the bigger picture is that um we ha we've sort of fought the fort fight to make palliative care a public health issue we have it on the agenda of public health people, uh, of, of the World Health Organization, of the World Bank, of a variety of other important bilateral funders, et cetera. We have a human rights co component to it. But I think what the audience, I think, should be aware of is the fact that there still is such profound inequity. And so for us to move this inequity forward and to work on the kind of policies that Eric has, has talked about uh, working at Mass General and then eventually in Vietnam and Rwanda mm -hmm. and other countries, was that we, to be able to implement palliative care, you've got to know the numbers and you've got to be able to say them to give them to the government. So Stephen's work on the Global Atlas has been critical mm -hmm. because now they can't tell us there's nobody out there who needs these palliative care because we don't know what it is. They've defined it, they've categorized it, they've put the numbers on it. And then Eric brilliantly has worked on this serious health-related suffering index, which is a way for uh, countries to be able to assess that. And if they can assess it, then they need to know how many people are have serious health-related uh, suffering. And we brought together great economists, I mean, brilliant economists who bought into this and said, mm -hmm. you're right, we, this is another measure. So I think that why we should care about palliative care now is we have a handle that we never had before. Um, we have both the effectiveness data that's come out of developed countries, but now we have a handle in these low and middle income countries of a, a number that we can use and a way to be able to assess it. So I think, Eric, you should just talk a little bit about this, how you assess serious health-related suffering, because I think that's been a major step forward. Mm -hmm. this and it, and it, it covers the elderly, you know, it covers older persons, <laughs> it covers <laughs> geriatrics, it covers children, it covers a range. Yeah. And so it's not specific to any age group, uh, mm -hmm. but it's related, you know, disease-related in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, this was... Um the Lancet Commission was uh, chaired by uh, Felicia Knoll, um, who's an economist. Um, and the person I worked with, who I think I learned more from than from uh, anyone since I worked with you, Kathy, was uh, Dean Jameson, uh, who's a, also a, a, a world famous health economist, who gave me the ideas of how to start thinking about how to quantify uh, the the need for palliative care. And it was a remarkable conversation for over a year, which I, I just, I, I was so thrilling. Uh, and I, it was humbling because I realized that as a physician, even uh, with a lot of experience in palliative care, without this uh, knowledge of, of, uh, uh, of health economics and policy, severe limits of what one could do. So with his guidance, I developed a way uh, to to estimate uh, the need for palliative care, um, which was by identifying the 20 conditions listed in the ICD-10 that most commonly generate a need for palliative care, 95% of the need, and then what types of suffering, whether physical, psychological, social, or spiritual, uh, are associated with each of these conditions, malignant neoplasms, everything from malignant neoplasms to dementia to end-stage major organ failure, mm. um, and, and the duration of those symptoms. And that also then enabled a calculation of uh, or, and creation of a, uh, an essential package of palliative care to respond to uh, each type of suffering with each condition 
and even to calculate how much it would cost in each country by uh, costing each item in the essential package. So that's what the uh, the uh, uh, Lancet Commission did, and it's thrilling to see uh, Stephen uh, as the editor of the uh, the Global Atlas to absorb that method uh, into the work of the WHO. So uh, we know now uh, we have a pretty good idea of what the needs are. The needs are enormous in the mm-hmm. developing world, and they're unmet needs. A lot of the need, not all of it, but a lot of the need is met in rich countries, but not in poor countries. And segue coming up here, there's huge demographic demographic shifts that are happening, not only mm-hmm. because uh, the shift from more, uh, infectious diseases to more non-communicable diseases, but also the demographic, d- demographic shifts that take young people out of homes, more movement of people so that older people are not cared for as much, especially in the developing world, uh, in quickly developing countries, by their kids, by their grandkids. They're more on their own. So this is a huge problem. Who's going to take care of older people who in the past were cared for uh, by their kids and grandkids? And can we get some, maybe some examples of what are some of these needs? I'm guessing it's for both primary and specialty palliative care, but I'm also guessing it's access to medications uh, for palliative care. Can, yeah. How would yeah, you describe... You could talk about that. Kathy. So one of, one of the greatest public health inequities that uh, was identified in the Lancet Commission report was the lack of availability of essential medicines for pain relief. And I mean, the economists were shocked. I mean, they were quite... In amazed at the idea that this was such an extraordinary public health inequity where there was lack of availability of essential medicines as analgesics. So that stood out. But the, the second area was this lack of availability of essential medicines for symptom control. Mm-hmm. That was a second area that was really profound. So you can't begin to get governments to think they should pay for these essential medicines, even though they've agreed on, on to a policy on essential medicines. But for them to pay for them, they have to cost them out. They have to know what they are. So by Eric putting together this health-related um, suffering and by identifying the symptoms and by, more importantly, um, various organizations putting together an essential medicine list for palliative care, we know what the governments need to have and we know what they need to pay for. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric, Eric, we we know uh, we, we need millions of people trained in palliative care that are not trained now. Everybody that graduates from us. Right professional school should have training in basic training in palliative care. And we, and we think that about two thirds of people could be cared for by their primary care physicians without referral necessarily to specialist palliative care providers. Mm-hmm. If they had training in palliative care, then we don't need to be a specialist necessarily. And symptoms, you know, some patients are much more, have much more severe uh, suffering than others and symptoms um, uh, th- that can be managed, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a decent um, health care system. Uh, part of the problem we have in terms of models is we've got this high income model. And, you know, Cicely told us, you know, to, to just find a way to do it in your setting the way that makes the most sense. So um, we find... When Stephen is, says Cicely, by the way. He, Cicely, he's from, Cicely Saunders. Yes. Sorry. Not too many Cicely's in palliative care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just want to yeah, be sure our so, listeners are but, clear. Yeah. yeah uh, so there was a program, a project. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a program in southern India and in Kerala started by Sureti <laughs> Kumar called the Neighborhood Network for Palliative Care. And that is a model that has used volunteers and um, backed up by health professionals to deliver palliative care at the front mm-hmm. in the neighborhood they, that the people live in. Actually, it's it's a really interesting model. It's been we've 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 tried we've modified it and made it indigenous in uh, lots of other countries, but it's really driven by uh, the community and by uh, para professionals. A lot of these people, professionals like you know teachers or social workers, whatever, and they were trained in palliative care and they were out there checking on people. But they, when someone started to have more severe symptomatology or you know problems with pain, what have you, the, they were able to, to bring right in the nurses and, and physicians needed to be able to prescribe and, and uh, assess for uh, that patient um, what was really going on with them. Mm-hmm. The doctors couldn't do. Uh, but that's a model that's used all over the world now in various ways. And it's Something we should look at here because, I mean, we have our problems with 
uh, what I would term guild issues within the United States uh, when it comes to healthcare, and that includes palliative care. We don't want a task shift, you know. Uh, the, home, the home health aides could do, be doing a lot more than they're doing now, and volunteers could mm-hmm. be doing. Um, and it would it would hurt. Uh, I mean, for legal issues, but well, that's, that's interesting too because it often feels like. You know the the older model. You know the U.S. is gonna you know send experts over to another country and teach them how to do this thing. Recognizing the U.S. healthcare system is screwed up in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, we, let amazing. me count the ways. Yeah, wants us to do anything. <laughs> yeah. um, Eric, you've just touched on something there that's really important, and it's not just because the U.S. healthcare system is screwed up. It's much deeper than that. Europe. Uh, the, Europe and the United States, the Western countries, have always, for centuries, have always thought that they know how to do things better than yeah. all the other cultures of the world, and we need to go and enlighten the unenlightened. And that's, for me, that's what's most fundamental about uh, uh, bigotry in general, that we think we know how to do things better. So at the beginning of this call, Uh, we were talking about why should our audience care? Well, I think the one answer that we've already provided is because there's a sea of unnecessary suffering out there that shouldn't be, Mm -hmm. that we should, uh, that that we who have the means should find a way to, to make sure that people are not suffering for lack of very cheap, very safe, very effective medicines and treatments mm-hmm. that they don't have yeah, access to. So we have, we have the medicines and we have the know-how. We have the, the training to do this. So we, this unnecessary suffering is unacceptable. That's why mm-hmm. they should be here. That's, that's, one, that's one answer. That's maybe the, the first answer. The second is that in uh, our, our European American uh, 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 zeal, uh, to enlighten the unenlightened, we failed to recognize, we failed to learn from others. And I'm going to, so I've just in recent years been starting to get into this, but uh, I think it's really important. Uh, let me give you one example uh, from Rwanda. Uh, uh, Kathy mentioned that uh, I've been working in Rwanda for years with partners in health, thanks to Paul Farmer and his amazing mm-hmm. group. Um uh, to integrate palliative care into the healthcare system there. And one of uh, my uh, colleagues, Dr. Christian Tizimira, is very interested in traditions of caregiving for older persons, older adults, and at the end of life. And what he's found working with an anthropologist in Rwanda and uh, here in Boston when he was doing his master's at Harvard is that there was a tradition in that region of death as accomplishment. That is, uh, the last week's days uh, uh, of life were not a sad time. It was a time for the family to come together, celebrate the life of the person who was being honored. And it seems that this was also a time for the dying person uh, to prepare for the next step, which was to join the ancestors, which was something, and the ancestors were revered. So it's actually a kind of a happy time. And the introduction of the Europeans uh, with their ideas of heaven and hell introduced a concept that hadn't existed before, that death can be scary because I might go to hell. So that's a massive oversimplification, but that's just one example. There, Every culture, since time immemorial, has had a way of dealing with aging and uh, frailty and death. And there's a lot that can be learned from that. And I'm just going to give one more example. Uh, I'm working with colleagues in China now. And I think as Stephen or both Stephen and Kathy mentioned, palliative care is not one specific activity. Palliative care, what it should be, what it should consist of, depends on the needs of the population served. And people don't suffer the same way in rural Malawi as they do in Boston or as they do in Ho Chi Minh City. So palliative care needs to differ. How do you translate palliative care into Mandarin, into Chinese? So there's been a fascinating discussion about what is 
optimum palliative care? What is optimum care for the seriously ill and the dying in China? And mm -hmm. what what uh, in a big discussion with uh, 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 with a lot of people, the characters and I think, Alex, you speak uh, Chinese. Uh, so I can tell you what we've no. come up with. Uh, your wife does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally, uh, I think it means something like medical care, health care, not medical, health care for comfort and harmony. Hu <laughs> is harmony. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing about cloaks or a palace. It's uh -huh. health care for comfort and harmony, harmony with self, harmony with others, harmony with the environment. That's mm -hmm. what's meaningful in Mandarin. So it's it, it's different. And this is important, not just for Asian Americans or Chinese uh, Americans or Chinese Canadians who may bring this culture with them. This can inform how we take care of people in Boston. And we need harmony in the U.S. healthcare system. A little mm -hmm. harmony wouldn't hurt. <laughs> would it, Stephen? <laughs> badly. Badly in need of harmony. And, and Stephen, and Alex, you yeah, know, coming from your perspective too, like when you think about palliative care services that are developing worldwide and all of these different countries, um, I'm, ge you know, I'm guessing some are focused on our hospice and around palliative care. Like how, how do you think about that question, what it looks well, like? The word hosp hospice actually is um, more, you know, a, a more high income country kind of language. We uh -huh. tend to use palliative care around the world uh, as, a, as, a, as a bigger sort of frame, framework. Uh, and, you know, you know, that, uh, the origin of the term palliative care, of course, uh, from Balfour Mount in uh, Canada, which was just a cloak. And, you know, it was because it was only because he couldn't sell the word hospice in French Canada because it meant in French Canadian poor house. Poor, poor oh, house. I didn't know yeah. that part of the story. Oh, yeah. but, but, I mean, but I think, as, as Stephen is saying, there was a strong movement to not to address the, the needless suffering of large populations of, of uh, individuals in their last year of life rather than in the last days of life. And so there was a very strong movement to move from hospice to the broader concept of palliative care that Balfour Mount had promoted um, and to use that term. And it was more acceptable in translation and to other countries to use that term. So, so as much as people want to use other terms like supportive care and we could go through 100 other names, uh -huh. the importance of palliative care is that we built policies around it. And so, the, you know, the Worldwide Hospice and Palliative Care Association, the uh, WHO in 2014 came out with a resolution um, in which the member states signed on and said that they would be supportive of promoting palliative care uh, for their uh, uh, individuals in their country. So they signed a resolution saying they're committing to this um, in attempts with in, with in working with the human rights uh, groups. The word in language palliative care has been used. And again, it's to focus on this idea of people with life limiting serious illnesses um, and, and not to focus on specifically on end of life care, but more broadly, this last you know years of life and the needs of that population. And so importantly, in the rights of the, el of the elder persons, I think is the name of the human rights document, there was nothing ever said about palliative care. <laughs> And so we again went to the uh, went to the UN and were able to include palliative care in that document to be sure that uh, that the uh, that the rights of older persons that they would have access to palliative care. So there's a lot of meaning in palliative care as a policy word. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's important for people to think of it and use it that way. This is not in any way to speak disparagingly about hospice work or hospices. They're incredibly critical, and they were the beginnings of this. But the policy agenda is a is a bigger agenda, and palliative care is the language we need to use there. Mm -hmm. The resolution says um, strengthening palliative care in the continuum of care. Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, which is really important. Before Eric waves asks you the wave the magic wand question, which we ask our guests at the end of each podcast, I just want to reiterate um, what I've heard so far and summarize. And I've heard that there's tremendous need for palliative care because there are people living with serious illness around the globe 
who have unmet needs for palliative care. And that crosses a, a whole range of domains from symptom management to psychosocial to caregiver. Mm -hmm. And that with the aging of the population globally and shifts, demographic shifts in the way people live their lives and the way they care for older adults, there'll be a tremendous growth in the need for geriatric specific palliative care worldwide. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I would say in dementia, this is the longest we have gone in a podcast without mentioning the word aducanumab. Um, I'll just note that for our listeners who have listened to our previous podcast. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll also say that it's important to that we, we not impose our norms and moral standards and mechanisms of palliative care delivery that we have developed in the United States or in Canada or in Europe or in Australia upon uh, other countries because they have their they they we should instead this is like implementation science mm -hmm. think about how we can get to the underlying issue of um, providing high quality care for people with serious illness and that includes uh, relief of suffering but we have to situate it within the cultural context within the the history within the um, ways and systems that they have in place already and strengths that they bring to bear um, uh, 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 across the globe. Uh, Good summary. Sure. <laughs> Eric, with that framework, because there's so much there yeah. um, and Eric's going to make you choose one thing, like if you could make a magic wand with one <laughs> thing, what would your um, highest price? Go ahead, Eric. You asked the question. No, I think you just asked the question. If you had, if you had a magic wand right now, anything related to international palliative care, what would you do, Eric? Start off with you. Oh, I'll give you uh, uh, two answers. Uh, one is uh, <laughs> that it wouldn't be. He's cheating already. Specific. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what we do. Uh, uh, it would be to. Uh, change the way we think about others, uh, no longer think about them based on their use value, but uh, think of them as, uh, as others who have a value in themselves. And therefore, older people, older adults, uh, are, are, do not diminish in their value when they can't work and should be put in nursing homes. They are to be respected and cared for as honored uh, members of the family and the community. That's my, that's my uh, 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 change in thinking. Uh, something very concrete. How about this? Adult diapers... Uh, that's a demeaning term, diapers, uh, adult sanitary shorts that are eco-friendly, biodegradable, and cheap so that they can be universally available and family <laughs> caregivers uh, do not have uh, the stress of dealing with incontinence all the time. How about that? Big and a, a very concrete example. Kathy, your magic wand. Yeah, mine would be that we uh, educate health professionals uh, and we pay them to do this work. And the only way, so my magic wand is we need these, this data that Stephen and, and Eric have put together to convince governments to pay for it. Um, yeah. And in that way, then we'll have healthcare professionals that can do it. But we need to educate them. So there's two pieces to that. And Stephen, the magic wand still has a little bit of left in it. Uh, I'd like to be able to lessen the uh, death anxiety in the world because that's been, you know, what prevents people from embracing In any the, ways I mean, on how to do that. I know that's a whole nother podcast. If you're, if you're magic wand, it has to be concrete now. Is there anything? Oh. Uh, well, I think, you know, we, we do need to remember that we need, we, we need psychological services within palliative mm -hmm. care. And mm -hmm. sometimes we're a little too medically oriented. I'd like to see that, that holisticness balanced a bit more with the, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a, it's not a diaper. No, that's perfect. All right. Uh, Alex is going to be upset at me because it's going to eat into his song. But Kathy, I got one last question for you. For those who you've motivated that we should care, we should do something about this. And, you know, they're like me. You know, they, they have their, they work in their medical center. They're, they're, they're trying to do what they're doing, but they also see the need that's out there mm -hmm. far outside their institutional walls. Where does one start? 
if yeah, you want to I, I mean, help. I, I do think you should start at home. So, so I mean, you live in San Francisco. It seems to me you have a lot of resource limited issues on the streets of San Francisco that where you could start. Yeah. So I don't know that you need to go to a, a, a low resource country to do that. But being very specific, the, um, I think the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine does have an international group. Um, and I'm well, glad to provide people with that, that group that's trying to do this work. And then um, I think you could hear from Stephen. Uh, there's the uh, Worldwide Hospice and Palliative Care Association that does a lot of work and groups that are asking for help. Um, the Indian Palliative Care Association loves any teacher that will come at any time, and they will communicate with you about that. And then lastly, the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care um, similarly um, has a, a whole international um, effort. The, inter the International oh, Children's Palliative Care. And the International Children's Palliative Care. So there are these international organizations that are on websites and are looking for people um, to donate their time. Great. Right. And we'll have links to all of those on yeah, our Jerry Powell show notes. So mm -hmm. if people are interested, that's one right. way. I want to thank all of you for joining us. But before thank we so end, much. we got a little bit more. What the world needs now is a little palliative care. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love What the world needs now is love, sweet love No, not just for some, but for everyone Well... Kathy, Stefan, Eric, thank you for joining us on this Jerry Pal podcast. It really was a pleasure. And thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing. Thanks thank for having us. Thank you. And I just want to lastly say thanks to Kathy Foley, without <laughs> whom I wouldn't be, none of us would be what we where we are, and palliative care would be nowhere near what it is. Kathy, thank you. You're welcome, Eric, but thank you for all the good work that you've done. There's so many people that have made such a difference. Yeah. So many people. And uh, a very big shout out to uh, Archstone Foundation for continued support and to all of our listeners and to all of those people who are doing amazing work worldwide. Geriatrics and palliative care really is amazing. You know, it's hard enough to do this in a well resourced environment that uh, I am constantly impressed it can happen elsewhere too. So, big thank yeah. you. We'd also like to thank our listeners who are supporting the Jerry Pell podcast at at least the $250 level. And those include Meg Wallhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulsky, Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Marianne Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lundeberg, and Gail Cooney. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>